There we go. All right. You finally liked her. Okay. Let's take a look. Today is actually Palm Sunday as we're preparing for early Easter this year. But our message today in John, I believe, goes right along with the message of Palm Sunday. And I've entitled the message, A Water That Satisfies. And I think we're going to see ourselves in this story today. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. A couple of things in those first three verses. Number one, uh, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was baptizing more than John. So what did they do? They tried to cause division among the people. Mm -hmm. uh, much like we see going on in our world today. Yeah. Uh, you know, Whites against blacks, blacks against whites, whites against Asians, everybody else against everybody else, everybody apologizing for everybody's problems, you know. They try to make a division between the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of John. But Jesus, already knowing what they were going to do, would have nothing to do with it. He wasn't in a competition with John. You know, there's a lot of churches that need to learn that today. There's a lot of churches out here that need to learn. We're not in competition with each other. We're all supposed to be working for the same person Amen. and supposed to be working for the same goal. Yes. And we're not supposed to be in com competition with one another. And, uh, but there's so much of that going on today. But anyway, Jesus saw how to handle the problem. John had everything under control. He still had a lot of people following him. He was baptizing. Jesus left. He didn't want any conflict, so he left. But there was another reason that Jesus left. There's a very important sentence in verse number 4. And you have to read this close because it's easy to pass over it. But notice what the scripture says. And he had to pass through Samaria. He didn't just casually go through Samaria. Any Jew, no self-respecting Jew, would just go through Samaria. In fact, a Jew would go miles and hours out of their way rather than go through the dreaded Samaria. But the scripture says he had to pass through Samaria. Folks, Jesus had a divine appointment. Have you ever had a divine appointment? You know when they happen. I've had several of them. When God puts somebody in your path, and you know that God brought this about. <laughs> Jesus had a divine appointment. I uh, heard a young boy was walking home from school one day, and he noticed a kid in his class. He was a smaller young man, and all the boys picked on him a lot. And he was uh, carrying, looked like he had every book he had in his knapsack on his back, carrying it home. And, and he noticed a bunch of the bigger boys started picking on him. And they knocked his books out of his hands, and they all fell on the street, and they laughed at him. And this big boy, he's, he was, this kid was on the football team, and he's a pretty good-sized kid, so he went over and told him, get out, leave, leave him alone, and took up for him. He helped the young boy pick up his books, walked him on home, talked to him a little bit, and got to know him. And it so happened that the young football player was a Christian. So he struck up a friendship with this young boy, led the young boy to Christ. And many weeks later, the young boy said, I, need to, I want to tell you something. He said, well, what is it? He said, you remember the day that we met when the other boys were picking on me and knocked all my books out of my hands and you took up for me? He said, yeah, I remember, I remember. He said, that day, he said, I was taking all of my books home because when I got home, I was going to commit suicide. And you came along. He said, you saved my life. That's what's known as a divine appointment. God may put somebody in your path. You may not even understand it at the time. You just let God lead you. 
And it's very simple. You just do what Jesus would do. And let God take care of the details. Folks, we have divine appointments all the time and don't even know it. If you're open to them, Jesus will use them. So he had to go through Samaria. And he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near a parcel of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being weary from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now that's around noon Jewish time. And then comes an interesting statement. And again, you have to read into and behind the lines here. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now remember, it's, this is noon. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. First of all, the women of the town who came to draw water came early in the morning while it was cool. So the first obvious question was, why was this woman coming in the heat of the day at noon? Now Jesus knew. Remember, this is a divine appointment. We'll, we'll find out later that the reason she came at this time of day was because she was an outcast in town. She had been married five times, and the man she was living with now was not her husband. But Jesus already knew that. Now, remember I said a self-respecting Jew would not go through Samaria. But look what Jesus said. Jesus speaking to this woman. He said, give me a drink. This is the Jesus. He, he brought water from a rock. He turned water into wine. He created the rivers and he created the oceans and he says to this Samaritan woman, give me a drink. You see what he's doing? Folks, this is how you witness to people. When you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, this is how you witness to people. Jesus did this. Every, everywhere he went, Jesus did this. And you can do it too. If you want to witness to somebody about Jesus, the first thing you do when you start talking to somebody is you find common ground. You learn this as you're, if you're going door to door and you're going to people's houses to visit. When you walk up, you look and see if there's any tricycles, any toys around the yard. What does that tell you? Yeah. They've got children. You walk in and you make a quick scan of the room. You know, the first some fishing trophies hanging, hanging, or pictures hanging up on the wall or trophies. What's the first thing you want to bring the conversation around to? You want to start talking about fishing. You want to meet people where they are. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus met people where they were. This woman, he knew she was an outcast. She came to the well. Jesus didn't need her to get a drink. But he said, would you give me a drink? This blew her away. For a Jew to ask her for a drink. In fact, she says so. His disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You know, we deal with today, they want to, every time somebody says something today that doesn't disagree with, doesn't agree with somebody else, you're a racist, you know, you, you're a racist because you think this way. This, the, the Jews were racist. When it came to Samaritans, they were racist. They didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. For a Jewish person to talk to a Samaritan would be like back in the early 60s for a member of the KKK in southern Mississippi to go and ask a black woman for a drink. There's a comparison for you. It wasn't done. First of all, the most black people wouldn't have given him a drink, but he wouldn't have asked. But that's how much the Samaritans hated the Jews and vice versa. And I'll explain to you in a minute why they hated them so much. But folks, as we talked about a little bit about in Sunday school this morning, Jesus calls us to be his witnesses to the world. Yes. If we're going to be a witness to the world, we've got to go out into the world. Now, we don't have to be a part of the world. Amen. But we must go out into the world. Paul dealt with that in Corinthians. And he, he was talking when he's talking to the people in 1 Corinthians. And she's getting ready to put it up for him. He said, I did not by all means did not mean immoral people of the world, 
or with the covetous or the swindlers or the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. So we have to deal with the world, but we don't have to become one of them. If you've ever gone fishing in a boat, now as long as you're in the boat and the boat's in the water, you're okay, right? But when the water gets in the boat, then we got a problem. We have to go out into the world, and if we didn't go out into the world, we wouldn't be able to go outside this building. We have to be among the world. And most of the world are pagans and belong to the devil. Let's just be honest. That's why they're out in the world. Some of them may be some of the nicest people you know, but they're just as lost as the worst ones you know. If they don't belong to Jesus, they're lost. So we have to go out into the world. The secret is going out into the world and standing for Christ and not becoming part of the world. And that's a danger we're really dealing with today. We're getting put down. We're getting shunned. In fact, we're living in a, a, a woke environment today that if, if they don't agree, if you don't agree with them, they want to shut you down, mm -hmm. shut you up, shut you off, shut your business down. Yes. But we have to go out and witness to them in the process. Jesus made an appointment to deal with this lady and to witness to her. Jesus came for everybody. Jesus didn't come for the Jews. Jesus didn't come for the Gentiles. Jesus didn't come for the whites or the blacks or the Asians. Jesus came for everybody. As I said this morning, I told you on Sunday school, everybody around this country today is yelling racism, racism. And here's the problem. Everybody wants to solve the problem of racism without God. They don't want anything to do with God. I can solve the problem for them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Problem solved. You see, he didn't put any color on that. Love your neighbor as yourself. And when one asked him what who his neighbor was, he gave him the, the, road, the parable about the Good Samaritan, did he not? So we're, we're living in a world where we're called to witness. Jesus came on the scene... For one thing, and that was to save souls. He left us here for one thing, and that is to save souls, to witness to people. We're called to share the gospel. You see, the Samaritans were half-breeds. When they were captured and taken, Sargon captured the Samaritans and took them, and when they he captured people, he would take some, so many of their people away and then he would leave so many of his people there and they would interbreed with them and they became half-breeds like in America when we have the, the deal with the, the white men and the Indians. You know, if a half-breed was not, was not welcomed in the Indian camp and he wasn't welcomed in the white man's camp. So the Samaritans were half-breeds, but what made it worse was the way the Samaritans acted. If everything was going good for the Jews, they identified as Jews. They wanted to be part of it. Remember when they were back when Nehemiah, when they were building the temple, and Sanballat and them came to him and wanted to help build the temple, and Ezra said, don't need your help. Get out of here. Well, when things were going good, they wanted to be Jews. But guess what? When things started going bad for the Jews, and they were getting persecuted, they identified themselves as Medes and Persians. The other half. So that's why the Jews hated them so much. They weren't what they called pure Jews. And the Jews were very strong on this, folks. They, everybody could give you their, give you their lifeline, all, their descendants, all the way back, what line they came from, all the way back to Abraham. So here we have a problem. She said, how dare you ask me? That's what she was saying in her language. How dare you ask me for a drink? But then something very interesting happened. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. God offers living water Amen. freely. It can't be bought. You, you can't buy a gift. If somebody offers you a gift, you can't buy it. You can't buy it. It's a gift. It's free. What did he say in John 3.16? Whosoever 
Whosoever, that means you, me, everyone. Whosoever. We live in a world today where hatred and racism does exist. Here's the sad part. Hatred and racism both are taught. You're not born thinking that way. You're taught to hate. You're taught to hate. Jesus didn't hate anything, anybody. He hated sin. And he came to this woman who was an outcast. And he said, if you just knew who you were talking to. He said, you'd ask for water that I could give you. And you'd never thirst again. Amen. Folks, he's got that same water. He's been offering up water ever since he came. Yeah. He came to her and she didn't know him. She didn't recognize who she was talking to. But the day he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, and they threw the palm branches out and they threw their robes out in the street and he rode by and they were shouting, Hail, Hosanna, Hosanna. But folks, let me tell you something. They were calling the right name. But they still didn't know who they were talking to. You see, they were expecting this king to ride in that was going to take over, destroy the Roman army, set up his kingdom, and they were all just going to serve him. They were shouting the right name, but they still didn't know who they were talking to. Just like this woman. She was seeking after something. She was seeking after something much more than water. But she didn't know what she needed. Jesus came to fulfill that need. What was that song we sang? Fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. Jesus came to fill our cup. If we will ask Him, if we will seek after Him, we're going to see something very beautiful in this story before we finish. Give me, if you knew who said give me a drink, you would have asked and He would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where then will you get that living water? And you know, she's doing something here that many of us do. He's sitting here on the well. There wasn't a bucket to her to draw water with. There was water in the well, but he said he was going to give her water. But you see, all she was trusting was what she could see. Sir, how are you going to get me water? You have nothing to draw water with. Do you ever catch yourself doing that? Do you ever catch yourself just trusting Jesus with what you can see? Instead of what he said he would do? It's easy to trust Jesus with the things that we can see. What about when Jesus says, makes a promise, his word tells you he'll do so and so, and you pray about it, but you don't see a way he could do it because you don't see it happening. Where's your trust then? It's called faith, folks. Yeah. Jesus is getting ready to give us a shiny example of this in the story. Where do you get that living water? And then she said something she didn't know what she was saying. You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Again, she didn't know who she was talking to. But it's amazing here what she's saying. The Pharisees asked him that same question. What did Jesus say to them? They said, are you greater than our father Abraham? Jesus said, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they said, you, what? Are you, are, you're, you were before Abraham? You can't be 40 years old. And he said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. This woman has no idea of still who she's talking to. But she's realizing something. 
She's realizing that she has a need. God can't help you until you realize you have a need. God can't save anybody until they realize they're lost. You can witness to people, give them the gospel over and over and over again, but the first thing you have to do before you get somebody saved is get them lost. They need to realize they're lost. We got a lot of people sitting in church today and running around this country and running around this world. They think they're okay because they believe in God and they go to church. And they're lost as a goose in a snowstorm. They think going to church every week is going to make God happy. They believe in God. I got some relatives that think they're okay because they believe in God. Yet if I start talking to them about Jesus very much, they'll quit talking to me. Folks, let me just say this. If you really love God, you'll love to talk about His Son. If you love God, you love Jesus. Because Jesus said, the I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He offered her not what she asked for. He offered her what she needed. Jesus does the same for us. You know the reason a lot of our prayers don't get answered? Because we don't need what we ask for. God never one time in His Word ever said, I'll give you your desires. I'll give you what you want. He did say, though, I'll meet all your needs. Amen. According to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Our problem is many times we take our wants and we think they're needs and we pray like they're needs. And God never promised to give us our wants. He didn't. He offered her something that she didn't even know she needed. She thought she was okay. She was a descendant. Remember what she said? She's a descendant of Abraham, Jacob. Our father Jacob, she, they call themselves descendants. There was a way they went through that to make themselves, they went through the line to, to get their lineage from Jacob even though they were interbred with another race. Josephus, the historian, deals with that and talks about it. But that's what God does. We can pray for one thing, but God knows what we need. God will answer your prayer sometimes. You think, well, God didn't answer my prayer. And God said, well, I answered your prayer. I just gave you what you needed instead of what you asked for. That's right. You ever look back on a situation and say, well, I'm God, glad God didn't answer that prayer? I used to, I sung that song a few times that Garth Brooks used to have out of actually sung at church a few times because I thought it fit very well. Thank God for unanswered prayer. Yes. Can you look back in your life and thank God for unanswered prayer? Oh, Lord, I'm glad. If I, I tell you what, every once in a while we go back to our, family, our class reunions about every five years, we had been. And uh, when you see some of those uh, beautiful flowers that were in, their, in your high school and you see them today, you think, thank you, God. Glad you didn't answer that one. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Appreciate that. Uh, the flowers have wilted. And so God, God knows what we need, not yeah. necessarily what we want. Now, He knows what you want, but He'll give you what you need. Amen. He knew what she was wanting, but He gave her what she needed. He offered her something she needed, and here's something. She couldn't get it anywhere else. He was the only one that could offer it. He's the only one that could give it. Look what He said. She said, you're not greater than our father Jacob. He said, if you knew who drinks this water... Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. Talking about the water she came for. Now Jeremiah alluded to this back in the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah. He said, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Folks, America is in a mess right now. The world's in a mess, but we're a big mess because we're supposed to be a Christian nation, which we've ceased to be. But the reason 
we're in such a mess is very simple. We've forsaken God. We've hewn for ourselves broken cisterns. We have said, God says to do this, but we don't need God. We don't want God. God has nothing to do with this. We're going to do it our way. Well, folks, God has left us to ourselves about the last 50 or 60 years since we decided we were going to do it our way. How are we doing? How's this country doing? Morals are extinct. Humility is extinct. Honesty is pretty much extinct. Hatred is pretty rampant. Folks, when the strongest tendencies you see are hatred for one another, let me tell you, that did not come from God. Our country has gotten into the mess. Our world has gotten into the mess we've gotten in because we did exactly what he said back in Jeremiah. He said, my people have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. The only hope we have rode into Jerusalem that day on that donkey. He's the only hope we have. And when we choose to do it our way and forsake Him, we are a lost people. And we have no hope. And the reason our world is in such a mess right now is because Satan's time is short and he knows it. And he's stirring up all of his people against one another. We're in a society today that if, if you disagree with somebody, you hate them. Well, it's just the opposite. As we mentioned in Sunday school this morning, if you differ disagree with somebody's lifestyle and say you've got a family member or a good friend and you care for that person you disagree with their lifestyle and they say well you must just hate me folks here's the simple truth if I hated them I wouldn't care how they live or if they spend eternity in hell right. amen if you really if you don't care about anybody you don't care where they end up amen. you don't care how they live you don't care where they end up but if you love them you care and you'll share Jesus with them He's dealing with a woman here that doesn't even know what she needs. He said, if you drink this water, talking about the water in the well, he said, you're going to thirst again. But, oh, here it is. But if you drink the water I give you, folks, you were born with a thirst. God put a little spot in your heart. Now, we try to fill it with everything under the sun. Solomon tried that. Read Ecclesiastes and see how that worked for him. Solomon tried that. We tried to fill that little void. People use money, sex, drugs, alcohol, you name it. Power, you name it. They try to fill that void. But you know what? They thirst again. Amen. You can't get enough money, you can't get enough sex, you can't get enough drugs, alcohol. You, you want more. You need more. But Jesus said, I'll give you water. And I'll give you water that will satisfy you. And the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. And folks, when you really get filled, when He really fills your cup, when you let Jesus fill your cup with His love, and you put all your trust in Him, you realize you don't need any more. You don't want any more. You've got, in fact, folks, if you let him, Jesus just overflow you with so much love, you'd have to say, Lord, turn it off. I can't take any more, Lord. I can't, I can't take it, Lord. Yes. God wants to love you. That's why he came into Jerusalem. That's why he came to die. He came to love us, to give us that living water that we would never thirst again. You said, you drink that water, you're going to get thirsty again. But then look what he said. Oh, I love this verse. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to what? Eternal life. Yeah. Jesus came into the world for one thing. He came that we might have life 
ever after and everlasting. A bum was walking down the street one day and he saw a, a lawyer coming toward him, well dressed. He recognized the lawyer and he stopped and asked him if he could have a quarter for a cup of coffee. The lawyer said, you look familiar, don't I know you? He said, yeah, you should. He said, we were in the same class in high school and he introduced himself. The lawyer said, I'm not even going to ask you what happened. But he said, I always thought you had potential. He said, I'll tell you what, I want you to get yourself straightened out. He took out his checkbook and he wrote him, wrote him a check for $100, signed it, and he said, I want you to take this down to the bank, you cash this check, go get yourself a cleaned up, get you some good clean clothes, and then come see me. Next day, the lawyer's walking down the street, runs into the guy again, the guy's still just like he was the day before. He said, uh, what happened? Did you, did you spend the money on something else? He said, oh no, I, I didn't cash the check. He said, what? He said, well, I went down to the bank and I looked in the window and I saw all these nice dressed people in there and they were looking so neat and groomed and I had that check in my hand and I said, I knew if I go in there looking like this, they're going to think I forged the check or I stole it. He said, you take that check down to that bank. You give it to the teller. He said, they're going to cash that check for you. He said, it doesn't make any difference what you look like. The only reason that check is good is my name is on the bottom of it. When Jesus came for you, people say, well, I need to get my life cleaned up, and then I'll come to Jesus. Oh, Jesus came for you just like you are. And He'll take you rags and all. You see, it doesn't make any difference what you look like. It doesn't make any difference what you've done. It doesn't make any difference what you've been through. When you stand before the Father, the only thing that's going to matter is when He says, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus signed the check. And that's all that counts. That's all that counts. We can't clean ourselves up enough to be accepted we can't clean ourselves up enough. If, if, if we could clean ourselves up and get rid of every sin we've ever committed except one, we still couldn't get into heaven. But if you'll just remember what Jesus came for. He rode into Jerusalem to die for your sins and mine. And when we stand before the Father, the only thing that's going to count is His name on the check. Amen. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, we thank You this morning as we near this time. Next week as we will